You know those jitters you get just before a presentation or pitching an idea? How about as a performer waiting backstage for your name or your music to begin? We all know the butterflies, nervousness, anxiety, even fear, if it happens to be strong enough. Some performers look for the butterflies to empower them with great performance, but not everyone sees their appearance as a gentle push. In fact, many people shy away from public speaking, group presentations, or even speaking up when more than two people happen to be present. Growing up, we were told to just ignore them and they disappear once we started dancing. But that wasn't always true. And I do remember one very infamous performance when I was about nine years old and my dad drove me to a special presentation. It was just dad, mom didn't come. And I kicked my Highland sword clear across two other sets of swords and wiped out performance for all of us. I was horrified. And my dad had witnessed the blunder. How was he gonna be proud of me? That stuck with me for a long time. Today's episode explores how I've learned to support myself and others with tools in bioenergetic wellness to calm fears, feel their power of support, and thrive because of them. And I'm joined by Colin McLeod from Scotland, who's played fiddle for the Movement Made Easy classes and shared a couple of special podcasts in season two. Today, we're discussing how to get to the heart of the performance, go past our egocentric drive to perform and find that heart-centered space where we often refer to it as the moment or the sweet spot. You're listening to Be Well with Michelle Greenwell, sponsored by the Cape Breton Tea Company and Dance Debut Inc. Hi, Colin. Thank you so much for joining me again today and being ready to discuss anxiety and heart-centered performing. Hello, Michelle. Lovely to be back. <laughs> so before we begin, let's uh, get the intention set for our listeners so that while they're listening, they can have a balance too. So I have pulled from my affirmations for the Body and Biofield deck, um, which you can find in the shop at dancedebut.com. I've chosen the card from the ash affirmations for the fascia and spine. So the cover looks like this which is actually the same color as the card that I chose, which is here. And these are photographs of nature around Cape Breton Island that have been run through filters by Tanya Levy, who's my co-author on this. And so we've got, for those people on podcast, it's a beautiful light blue and it has lines of white or light blue running through it. And the affirmation is around the note of G sharp um, which is related to the throat and brow chakra connection and the transition from the cervical spine to the base of the skull. So the affirmation is expression from our life's purpose is opened when we emphasize personal growth and introspection. Be aware of intuitive guidance and expression too. I think this is like perfect for our conversation today. All right. And so let's set the, we've got the intention set, but let's bring it in by how we're going to sip on our tea today. So Colin, what have you got in your mug today? Well, I've actually got um, some of the Canadian marvellous Miss Maple. Uh, so this is from the Cape Breton Tea Company. Awesome. And <laughs> this is the actual cup that it's in. You'll see that there's two sides to things. So I'm just going to be probably making a few notes through this podcast and um, the, the really so the marvellous Miss Maple uh, talks about life is excuse me <laughs> life is truly sweeter when you can drink maple syrup now when I think about that it's it's honestly it tastes so much like tasting whiskey you know I think I think it's the the sugar, but it's got a very distinctive flavour to it. So, so anyway, and yourself, Michelle, what what tea do you have? Oh, I w I was thinking about this is a place where we can transform from fear and anxiety for people to be able to start to express themselves. So I I was thinking about the um, tea with intention series, which is under mm -hmm. Cape Breton Tea Company, and that is releasing the warrior. And I know it sounds like a a huge title for a tea, 
it, it's not that uh, that big, strong piece of it, but it's got this nice, subtle nature to it. It has, I know you can't see it, but it has like a, an orange kind of hue to it. And then I, I put it, usually I have a mug, but today I thought, you know, I have a friend that stopped by and she said, I have a gift for you. And it was a teacup. And so for those people who are listening to the podcast, it's covered with bachelor buttons, which is interesting because most teacups have roses on them. And bachelor buttons are actually my favorite flower. And so I looked it up to see what is the meaning behind bachelor button. And that actually is about uh, men used to wear uh, the corn flower in their lapel to say they were available and looking for someone and wanting to uh, meet people. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting when we're thinking about the opportunity to have enough uh, confidence and the wherewithal to go out and try something different, do a performance, or even meet with people or present an idea. So I think that kind of links together. I, I think that was a really strong link. And I was going to say, even going along to a house concert, you know, like something... Um, the kitchen fest, for example, mm -hmm. you, you know, it's just people, it, it's actually, that that's a way to meet people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then it's, it's that confidence of sitting at the table and then turning to someone you don't know and saying, hello, how are you? Where are you from? Mm -hmm. In Cape Breton, that happens all the time. But sometimes we forget, you know, we're sitting with our friends and we don't realize the person beside us hasn't talked to anybody yet. And, you know, that hospitality is to turn and, and actually make that gesture of invitation. So cheers, Colin. Thank you for joining me on the podcast. Well, cheers, Michelle. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. So Colin, when you first began playing fiddle, and performing, how were your nerves for performance? Well, that's a very good question. I think it depended on what the um, perform, what I would class as, what I might class as a performance. Like, say, I was um, playing with other people as part of an orchestra, for example. Then I didn't sort of really classify that as a performance. But yet, because you're a group of people, you know, the sort of the the there's an even spread of effort. Like there's a team effort there. Where sort of the performance started, the performance now started to kick in was where it was something new. It might be going in for a fiddle competition, like the Golden Fiddle Awards, or even doing some of the Highland Games fiddle competitions in the US over the last few years. And uh, playing in a pub session, that used to be the case as well. So it's almost like unfamiliarity, what, what might people think, or playing in a band and feeling the responsibility of, you know, I, I know these tunes, so what, what can be created to help everyone play? Or, and uh, feeling like it's, the world is on your shoulders, when in fact, it takes a while to realise that, you know, just relax and become more comfortable with playing. You know, so it's almost like a 360 of jumping in and playing in a different situations, maybe playing the same tunes or in order to sort of like hone this diamond, hone this diamond of inspiration or this diamond of relaxation, you know, fun so that it can actually um, release its jewels to everyone around. And, and so it's taken quite a while about, you know, about performance nerves um, before a conference. And maybe I'll sort of talk a bit more about the tools, some of the tools that I've used um, or I'm using in order to sort of work with these nerves before a performance. And Michelle, what was your experience and how did you cope? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, it, it was, we were just told, you, you know, butterflies will be there, just go out and do it. But we weren't told what you could do about that. 
And so you'd have good performances, not so good performances. Um, and I, I just found over the years that it, um, it was easier if somebody invited you to perform, which is what they do here in Cape Breton, because mm -hmm. if you're at the dance and they start to play for the soloists, then in the past, they would have someone who would go around and pull the step dancers up to perform. And it's almost like you've been acknowledged to be able to step forward rather than you have the audacity to think that you're good enough to get up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so that, that lended itself to be a little bit gentler. But what I've really found over the years, it was when I started to shift what my outcome was going to be, that then it got easier to get up to perform. And as an instructor, it's expected of you because you have these, a, a whole bunch of students who are following that are all nervous. So you can't be nervous and you have to just turn it on. Um, but it, it, does, it does give you those performances where you do a really, really good job and then you do a really bad job. <laughs> or that imposter syndrome of that wasn't good enough because of all the things you thought about. And it's, um, I, I don't know in business, but in business, if you're presenting a concept, your mind is thinking of the concepts and you're also, you know, out of your mouth is coming your presentation. And in dance, it's similar. You know exactly where you want to go with the performance, particularly if the steps have all been choreographed. Um, but your head notices when there's a hesitation. And then it notices if the foot didn't quite go to the right spot. And so it's really easy to criticize afterwards. And um, I think it's the same in any presentation because it, you know, that I should have said it this way. I noticed people weren't, you know, identifying with what I was trying to say. I should have tried something else. And we can hindsight look back. And I think that builds the fear up even more that the next time you go to do it, well, the last time I did it, I did all of these things. And instead of acknowledging and accepting it was a good performance, whether that was business, presentation, um, at school, or if it was a, a music or a dance piece, all of them had good qualities or you wouldn't be in the position again. But it's still, we have this underlying fear that kind of takes over, so. And what, what did it feel like when when you had that perfect dance, like what, what, when things were just felt right? I, I think one of the, the best, well, there's two things. One is all the dancers that danced with me. So anybody who's listening to this podcast who was in performance with me will know I never did the same thing twice. I always changed the choreography around because my head was thinking about 40 dancers at one time. And I was trying to focus on my part, but also thinking of everyone else. So they were all very used to responding to whatever came off my feet or whichever way I turned. So there's that little piece um, where the perfect performance was when we all came together in this synergy. Um, but the second one is, um, is, I think, the example of doing step dancing as a soloist. I grew up doing performance in group, and it was uh, to recorded music. And when we came to visit Cape Breton and had live music, you didn't know what the fiddler was going to be playing, and you didn't know what steps were going to need to match that. And so the first time up to do a solo, was it was so nerve-wracking and devastating because you practiced all these fancy steps, you got up, and two very basic steps came out of your feet. <laughs> but each summer we came back and we kept trying and we would get up and we would try and we would try. And all of a sudden the one day it just, you just gave in to the music and the feet did their thing and some of those fancy steps came out. And that's when it was like, you're in the moment, you're in the pocket. And it's like, this feels right. And the whole body relaxes. So. I think that was the best way for me to realize that's when I finally got to the place of not trying to direct the performance, but to actually be in the performance. 
And I think that's what we, we had started talking about with heart-centered performing or heart-centered presentations. Yeah. The idea of being part of rather than out with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the sum of everyone together is what makes the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we each have something special to contribute. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think even my approach to teaching and my approach to presentations, because over the last few years I moved out of, out of performance and out of uh, dance into business. And when it's a collaborative approach with what you're doing, there's this synergy that comes together from all the people involved because there's a vested interest. And then there's this collective support piece that happens. And you notice that in, in uh, the dance world, if, if you were doing a group choreography and everybody pulled off the best that they could, but the audience at the end gave their applause, they hoots and hollers or whatever, and that's that lift that came together. And again, it was a collective piece that everybody just felt that synergy. And I think that's the comfort place. But for me, in these last couple of years, is really about how can I create a collaborative project or a collaborative approach? Because it's just so much more fun. And then everybody, everybody feels like they have a part of it, not just that I'm going to direct some information there their way and they can like it, not like it, take some notes, <laughs> drink their coffee. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a really vested interest. Would you say that's similar for you? Um, I would, there's an exponential potential for people to take ownership of the contribution. So it's almost like empowering people to do something or the way that I, I might play a, a decoration, other people might play it in a different way or use it in a different part of a tune. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's, the idea has been put on the, the table and the idea about what, you know, it's okay to play a certain way. Like, um, I've got a lot of influence from the bagpipes, so what that means is my decorations tend to be heard and the finger movements not really seen. Mm -hmm. It's different from a hedgehog going through your garden because a hedgehog moves really slowly. Um, and the idea about maybe using a small section of the bow and getting a really, really good sound out of it, that that short section allows you allows a, a greater speed of response when you're playing as part of a band or um, maybe playing in a session. So you can sort of, you know, and with dancing, that sort of can help the beat as well. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 the sound of everyone playing together, and it's it, it is the idea about collaboration. It might be um, two people, it might be four, it might be six, it might be five, it might be more. Mm -hmm. And releasing or empowering that that potential. That, that potential of sound and um, you know what Michelle what like we're, we're talking about in order to get that it's almost like people one, one something that really supports that is people feeling, feeling relaxed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so is there anything that you can recommend for a musician or a dancer to sort of create balance and flow for a performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this would go, this would go too for anybody who's making any kind of presentation because these tools work for, for anyone. Um, first of all, you have a goal, right? What is your goal? It might be just to do a good presentation. <laughs> you play the song correctly, you dance the routine to the best of your abilities, or you get across all of the concepts that you want to share in whatever you're, you're presenting. It could be that, but it also can be, if we're thinking about heart-centered, 
Then it's about I easily and joyfully share whatever experience and, you know, or bring joy to the people that are listening. And you actually shift it over from so much the technical aspect more to what is the artistic, um, somatic feelings that would come from the experience. And that's a great way to start to shift how you'll know if you got there. And then the second is to make sure you actually have drunk some water, hydration. And so people won't think that that's even important, except a lot of times before a presentation or a performance, you forget about the water. You're running around, you're doing all kinds of things as those last minute preparations. On that list needs to be have that sip of water ready to go. And it's not that you have to drink a whole bunch of water, it's just enough water so that the synapses in the cell structure is all ready to go and to be in flow for us. So that can be very helpful. Do you, uh, do you often have water close by? Stay hydrated I, I on a performance? I do actually. Uh, sometimes I do the opposite as well. I sort of have water and maybe a cup of coffee as well, but it's it's almost like to relax. And yes, I always have water. I always have water. It's almost like a non-negotiable. And um, I think with what you're saying, I will also be, you know, being a bit more considerate about what I'm doing, like being the actual drinking of it is not a question of just gulping it down I think you mentioned about even just thoughtfully swirling it around your mouth three times so that it goes to the parts of the body that it's supposed to go and you know and the idea about a performance and a presentation as well they really are similar mm -hmm. so you can sort of switch between these like you know it's a business concept it's a music concept mm -hmm. as well so they are readily interchangeable mm -hmm. and that's that's why i love I, when i think about you know kids coming up through the arts world mm -hmm. all the skills that they need for whatever they decide to do as an adult comes from these lovely experiences of performance and preparing things putting things together and then being proud of what they can offer to other people yeah Definitely. And something that what I'm seeing from a is the idea about the characteristic of a completer stroke finisher is such a rare characteristic and yet it's such an important life skill to have. And so when somebody's doing a presentation or a performance, you know, you're starting, you got the middle, the end, and you're wrapping things up. That's completing stroke finishing something or playing at a house concert in Cape Breton for a night, you know, and you got the start of the evening and you got the end, and then you might have a bit afterwards as well. Mm -hmm. that, that's still, you know, the idea about completer stroke finisher. And it, it's just, these are life skills that, that you can have fun with. That you mm -hmm. can actually have fun developing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so if I, if I look at, we've got our goal in mind, we've got hydration started. There are two, two pieces that I think, well, that three, <laughs> I'll mm -hmm. say three, um, okay. that I think are really important. And then, um, for dancers, uh, when I, I lost the ability to walk on my feet because of all the stressors going on in my business and in order to recover from that and to be able to gain muscle power back into my feet, I, I learned parts of a foot rub, but then I created a, a full package foot rub, the feet first system, so that I could have grounding and stability in my feet before I went out to do a performance or before I started to even talk to my class. And at that point, I was really nervous about how I was going to present material if it was going to be received the way I wanted it to be received. But if I rubbed my feet first, then I could feel that connection. And what I know now from that foot rub is that it actually links up all of the joints. And what links up the joints, you have information that travels faster through the body. 
And you want that in a performance because that means that if you are getting cues, your brain is going to pick up really fast on a cue that's going to tell you to do something slightly differently. And there's a fluidity there. There's yeah. There's a fluidity there. There's fluidity. You can read your audience a little bit more because you're not so nervous about trying to present, but actually seeing how is it being received. And uh, so that's where the, the foot rub became very helpful. From a musician's point of view, you're a fiddler. You might not need the foot to be rubbed, but the hands can be rubbed. It can be applied to the hands as well. That means that the articulation and the strength that's going to happen in the hands and in the arms is significantly different. So it takes effort out of trying to do, like you were talking about, some of those fancy pieces in the music. It takes the effort out of it so it can flow. And I think that gets you closer to your heart-centered kind mm -hmm. of performance because it's no, no longer about can you articulate the finger positions, it's more about can you roll through them as the music comes out um, and it becomes more articulated. And, and I think the timing of when you do these exercises, at, perhaps before the performance or the presentation, maybe even during or maybe even halfway, you know, during the interval, mm -hmm. that, that that would sort of, uh, like, you know, you can have sort of a top up during the interval, just easy ways mm -hmm. to keep, keep things flowing. And if you do it, um, if you're in a uh, performance of some sort with a group, if you mm -hmm. do it together, all of you are, are brought into synergy. So it's no longer that you all ran into the room and mm -hmm. you came from the different aspects of your life with whatever pieces are coming with you. And then, oh, here, quick, let's do this, do this project together. It's actually, we're all here, we're all connected, all the other stuff just kind of falls to the side and it's no longer important because now the focus is on the presentation or the performance that's ahead. So it's a great way to actually bring everybody collectively together. I think that's, that is such a brilliant concept <laughs> and it's also very true. Uh, I remember, you know, playing in a band and sort of rushing off somewhere, forgetting my kilt or, uh, you know, Shoes. <laughs> some, somebody else is, is sort of driving three hours to be, to be there. So we're sort of all in different stages of. Exactly. And then, yep. It, and it does take, you know, you want to be here rather than everyone in a different mind space, you know, mm -hmm. because that sound, having that that inspirational sound or being present for your presentation, for example, the audience can pick up on that. There's, mm -hmm. you know, or the, the dancers. Yeah. And they'll be saying the, the difference in their, the energy levels, the difference in how happy they are or the type of conversation that takes place at the interval. Mm -hmm. If everyone's, you know, playing as one, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you have a director, um, he's got somebody who's called you, five-minute call, um, or you have maybe you're in a conference and you've got different people who are running different parts of organizing, those people all have different agendas all to make the, the product work, yes, but they also still have a list in their head that they're running with. It's not the list you're running with. So the ability to calm the whole room just brings everything into focus. And then, like I said, those, those extraneous things that weren't important but were still in the list in the head can actually fall away. And then anything that really is important to exactly what's happening, it'll come to the forefront. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, if, if I go to the other one, um, it's the ear rub. And you may not think that's a valuable one, but we have this lovely vagus nerve that uh, comes up through the neck, goes up in behind the ear, and it is telling um, the brain what is happening with all the organ systems. So if they're really angst, 
you know, and people clenched their stomach, they didn't eat, they didn't have enough water, they're nervous. All of that is monitored by that vagus nerve. So the neck can become tighter. So if you're a singer or you're gonna speak, that can be a problem. But if you're a musician or a dancer, you also may not find the beat of the music because it's too tight and it puts you actually in a delayed position. So if you put the ear rub in first at the start, it, again, it synergizes the whole group, but it also opens up that vagus nerve, calms the system down, and now you can be on the beat of the music, you can play together with your group or dance together with your group. And if you're the person that's giving a lecture or um, presenting something, your voice has a different power that goes with it. And if you're calling dances, your voice has a different power mm -hmm. when you're calling dances. Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. So it's, um, it's and, and all these things just take like a couple minutes ahead mm -hmm. of a performance or ahead of an activity, and you can completely transform how much effort you have to put into that presentation. And that means that you can be around and energized for, for answering questions, for example. Perhaps mm -hmm. the dancers would like an encore, or so there's an energized feel from everyone there. Mm -hmm. So to me, that, that sounds like a really, really good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A piece that comes from Tai Chi that I think is mm -hmm. valuable and, and people don't think about it. Some people go for a walk. They'll say, oh, just to calm down, I'm just going to take a little walk around. But that walk action might have their hands in their pocket, might have them holding a, uh, um, could be a coffee mug. Some people are going to have a drink in their hand. Um, but they're not going to be moving their body as a whole unit. And so another piece that comes uh, from my Tai Chi background is if you do some spiral activities, so you're turning from the center of the body and you're turning one direction and turning back the other way, there's different kinds of activities you could do there. But what happens with that is you have this belt channel that goes around the center of the body, mm -hmm. kind of like where your belt would go on your pants. But when you rotate, it actually links up all the energy lines that run from the feet to the head, as well as, as you're turning, what happens going through the arms. And so once all of those are linked together, you now have all the systems talking. That's a lot better than going for a walk where you kept everything straight and things are moving and talking to their system, but they're not talking to each other. And that's what you really want, because again, to get to the heart of a, a presentation or performance is going to be about how melded you are. And if everything's in isolation, you have to wait for the time for everything to send the information, the brain to process it, and then bring it back. And that delay is the difference between I feel comfortable in my performance and I feel slightly off. And that can be the difference. And that could also be to do with members of a group playing together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that sort of magnifies things. And it's so a house concert or playing, you know, like Kitchen Fest or playing, um, playing for a dance. It's so much better if there's synch synchronicity between everyone and fluid fluidity. Um, presentation that the audience is going to have fun everyone will have fun mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a good example is um just what I see because I live in Cape Breton <laughs> and I get to go to the dances here but what happens is the musicians will all come in from different places and so they'll and some of them will have done two or three gigs in a day so they come in they come in with their instruments, they put everything down, they're like, they bring their instrument up, they're like, okay, I'm ready. And what happens is you have good music and the dance starts and you, you have dancers too that they didn't warm up either. They kind of came into the hall and they're, they got to get themselves together. So you get started and it's good, 
But it's not until you get closer to the end of the evening when everybody's in the energy. And then the, the fiddler will do the key change. And then everybody hoots and hollers. And then there's this lift that comes into the dancer's feet because they, they've been lifted up by that music. And the fluidity of the dance really starts to happen. And I think that's a great example of how if there had been this piece of bringing things together at the beginning, we could have been much faster to that. And we could have been in the pocket of performance for several square sets rather than the end square set, <laughs> which is usually what happens. And it's always that last hour of the evening when everything really lights up. First part's just kind of, it gets going. Um, and I think if we look at that and start thinking about, is that the kind of way we want to operate? Or do we really want to start to really pull things together and, and be able to be in the pocket like for the whole experience? I mean, that would just be so delightful. I, I agree. I mean, I think it probably takes me about 45 minutes to warm up or to when I start playing to actually get really get into the flow of things. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask, it's like, do you have like some examples of how you've used these tools with musicians or dancers? Mm -hmm. I do. I do. Mm -hmm. Um, if I looked at a musician, I worked with some different musicians over the years. Mm -hmm. I had one fiddler who commented to me one day, um, she left her fiddle out in the case, but she left it open so she would remember to practice. And she's an adult. So, you know, kids not practicing and parents having to remind, that's like comes with the territory. <laughs> but this is an adult who's a professional. But in order for her to practice, she would go back and forth past this case and this fiddle, but she wouldn't actually pick it up. And that's when I kind of twigged in that perhaps she wasn't connected to her instrument. And in fact, it was she resented the instrument because every time she walked past it and she hadn't practiced, she had this buildup <laughs> that went with it of, I didn't practice enough. And so we spent some time connecting to the instrument. And I know for listeners, that might be kind of hard to understand what does that mean, connecting to the instrument. But it's about finding out how do you feel when, when you hold the instrument? How do you feel when you're, you're striking the bow? And so we walked through all the scenarios of her playing, when she played, how she sat, how she stood. And we worked on bringing all of that into an energetic balance so that the fiddle actually felt good. And what happened was, over the next few weeks, she realized she kept picking the fiddle up. She'd go past it, and she'd stop, and she'd play a tune. And then she'd carry on with the day, and then she'd come back again. But it became joy. And if you fast forward that into her performance, now she just picks up the fiddle and she plays. And where we used to kind of hear a hesitancy in her music, that's all gone. And it's nice to listen to people in an audience now say, oh, she's just so fantastic when she plays whatever tune, or she just is so connected to the music. And then that whole piece is heard by the audience. So that's one of my examples. I, that, that sounds marvelous. And well, when I think about the violin or the fiddle or, or another instrument sort of being a, an extension of, the, of a person, you know, somebody playing the instrument, then I think to be comfortable with actually the instrument and the sound that it makes and it's like a person's voice or the expression of a person's voice. So that that's 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 really interesting. Mm hmm mm hmm Um I had a um uh piano player. It was uh, one of the Celtic color shows. Um, and I was just listening to him practice for warm-up. Everybody had kind of gone off to the green room and they were waiting. And um, he kept going back over this one section and he kept stumbling over the same part. And so I asked him, you know, what, what is, what's happening with that part of the music? He goes, I don't know, but every time I get here, I just can't get this one 
trill that comes through. So I sat down with him and, and we went back through the music to find out where in the music was it that he energetically stopped connecting to the actual um, notation. And then we did a couple of quick little exercises just to smooth that out for him. And the next time he sat down to play, he just went straight through. It was just, it was so fascinating to watch it. And again, it's another place where I hadn't thought about there would even be an energetic problem with looking at a piece of music. But if I think back to me learning classical, I had many places where I stumbled over things, but it would have been lovely to know it was the note of G that threw me off or maybe uh, throwing the sharps in. Um, maybe there was a particular key that I actually had trouble connecting with and then being able to energetically shift that so that that just is no longer a problem. And the flow coming from that, I mean, I'm sure people would pick up on it. The audience would definitely pick up on it. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the tune or the set of tunes being played more than once. Mm -hmm. So it, it's sort of, you know, there's that might lead for to the musician playing another variation or variations mm -hmm. that so the, the audience gets more delight mm -hmm. fr from the musician's music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, how, how about your dancers? How, how about... <laughs> you know, over the years, oh, we did so many things over the years. Um, mm -hmm. When I first started working with the tools, I had a set pattern that we used um, in the class. So we didn't put shoes on until we had run through the foot rub. Maybe I added a couple more exercises or sometimes I'd put centers around the room. Um, mm -hmm. But when it got to performance time, I started switching over to, instead of me running around, have you got your shoe, the, the, fix this bow tie, do, the, you know, all the little things that a director's going to do, I actually just started gathering in a circle. We went through the whole warm-up together as an entire group, and we made a connection, and then off we went. And I had one little girl, we were doing the Polar Express, and... Mm -hmm. Her role it was hard for her to focus. So her role in this was to hand out napkins. That's all she had to do was go from one side of the stage to the other and hand out napkins. And she couldn't do it. It was too much. But she was so excited to be in the show. And when I started doing that collective big circle, she was calm. She stood backstage. She waited for her cue. She knew when her cue was. She came out. She handed out her napkins went to the other side. Simple. But grandma, who usually came to help her uh, for dance class and everything, would be beside herself with this little one running around and not paying attention. And it just required the energetic connection with everybody. Now, how simple is that? And how can you transform a room just by adding those? And if you think about from a business perspective, and you, you're doing a big pitch to a group of people. It's not like you want to stand there, though, and <laughs> definitely do an energetic kind of piece in front of them. But there are ways that you can set the room up with, with color, intention, where you place things, um, how you present, and also even how you open the conversation, the kinds of words that you use. Um, and we do that as performers. The audience doesn't know that, but we do do that when we're setting ourselves up. Um, yeah. Now, these examples are very, there's insights there. And um, it, it, it is, th this, there's things that can go, that can happen behind the scenes in order to just have that heartfelt delivery or mm -hmm. to that enabled heartfelt delivery to facilitate it. And the warmth of the playing or the warmth of the presentation. And, um, you know, it'd be interesting to see if people, I've seen people mark on a programme at a festival, VVG, very, very, very good. Mm -hmm. v, VVG, very, very good. You know, mm -hmm. G. And, and just where, you know, where that sort of fits in or the inspiration of people hearing somebody speak 
and wanting to take action afterwards. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, really, you know, it, it's just very interesting. And um, the idea about people going away so happy from an event, like, I, um, you know, with the, the house concerts or the kitchen fest, I keep, or the colours, what time might people go away in the early morning from an event? It's, you know, it's, the show is supposed to stop at 11.30pm <laughs> and everyone's still there at 2.30am and just, you know, they've got special struts on the roof because they need to keep the roof in place because the energy levels inside would just sort of raise the roof and then people having fun. And, and yeah, you're right, because with Celtic colours, mm -hmm. um, you know, you might have a dinner before that you'll attend, which is a community dinner, which is great because you're, you're in the community and you're part of the, the whole island really comes alive. Um, I, I, I equate it to the frequency goes into the air and then everybody's exposed, not just the people who attend the show. <laughs> but then after the show finishes, which is supposed to be a two-hour show, but as a stage manager, very often it would not be a two-hour show. It has to be now if it's broadcast. But if it's not broadcast, you have a little bit of leeway. Um, but everybody always, like, once you find that pocket, everybody wants to keep going. And then, of course, the audience starts to stomp their feet here. Um, that's a sign of really good music. So the, the whole body is involved, the toe tapping, and then your applause at the end. But at Celtic Colors, you can then go up to the Gaelic College after the show and do the after hours at the club. And then that's where the, that synergy again, because you have different musicians who can come together and just like explore because nobody... Mm -hmm paid to see that particular concert series they came to see you as a performer but the pressure's now off because you could play whatever is going to like really inspire you and all of a sudden you have a drummer you've never worked with or a different keyboardist comes up and there's this whole different piece that goes on but that's like you found the pocket and now you get to sit in the pocket for a little while and uh for celtic colors there's a lot of um all-nighters, you know, where a lot of people eat breakfast at four or five in the morning and then head home. <laughs> that sounds quite intriguing. And I'd say to anyone out there in the world who's thinking about coming to Cape Breton this summer and for the fall for Kitchen, kitchen Fest or the Colours, then you're, you're on to something really special. And you mm -hmm. have so much fun, mm -hmm. so much to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that Absolutely. example of inspiration and heart-centered. Um, because to the people that come in, everybody's heart-centered on that. And if you take that back to a conference, as an example, mm -hmm. everybody's there because they're passionate about the subject. And then when you start to think, go past the details of the conference to make sure everybody gets from point A to point B, but you actually start to sit in on what are the conversations in the hallway? What are the, um, what are the partnerships that are be, being established backstage while people are waiting to go up to present? Or um, what happens when somebody introduces a new idea and light bulbs go off in people's heads of things they hadn't thought of and then how does that whole synergy come together? And when we can set up the space for that to be cultivated in such an easy and um, dynamic way, wow, we, we just explode possibility. We explode, even for the people presenting, we explode what comes out of them. I'm sure, Colin, you, you, know, you have that same kind of piece where you start playing and you're, you're in the music, but it's that place where you transition and, you know, time falls away, the audience falls away, people beside you fall away. Do you want to maybe describe a little of that? 
it's 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 almost like the sweet spot in in say a performance. Like th there's that rapport between the audience and the people performing. And I can remember doing a Mexican wave in a church. You know, you could just feel the band playing, and then we're literally doing a Mexican wave, and all the the pews, you know, people getting up and sort of down. <laughs> and it was that sort of introduction before everyone else jumped in with the music. And the amount of fun that people had um, it was just it was so it was just great. And <laughs> you know, there's there's this cheekiness to sort of try something slightly different or to sort of blend in with what's going on. And there's a, an extra je ne sais quoi that sort of lifts the music. There's that extra lift, th th just that lightness, or you know that 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 flow that that can come in, and everyone's at ease with that, with with that, and um, the amount of uh, I I have to do a lot more practices, but the amount of hooks, you know, that people might do in a dance. For for where everyone where there's that special fluidity there, uh -huh. there's going to be more of that sort of noise and celebration uh -huh. with with people, you know, doing doing the Kayleys or the, the Scottish country dancing. Uh -huh. And so that's one of my measurements, you know, and it's this rapport between the audience and the performer or the the audience and the speaker where there's that where you can just feel that warmth mm -hmm. then then you you just go where you know you go where you know you want to go yeah yeah and and it might be stretching you know you know what you've got you know what the rules are the boundaries are but in between that take a bit from one note to give it to another just to give it that extra lift when people are dancing mm -hmm. Just as you're saying that, and I'm thinking about, you know, when you pull the bow off the fiddle and you put space there, and it's that one moment, and everybody waits because it's like, where did the note go? And then you hit it, and everybody cheers afterwards, right? And it's like, there's so much within the space. And I think we forget that sometimes, too, when we're performing or or we're talking, when we're presenting. Just that that pause that people think for that moment and then dive into the next part. And I think with that is like all the senses are present equal. Mm -hmm. So it's like the awareness is there, what the audience is doing, what the dancers are doing, what your bandmates are doing as well. So there's like a synergy there mm -hmm. and everyone's just aware of what, what can be what what might might be created next mm -hmm. and you know it's it's just it's so much fun it's so much fun and <laughs> that that lift that um the happiness factor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know as you're saying all that i'm thinking about you know, as, as my business has transformed over the last couple of years and I've been, spent more time in front of my computer <laughs> mm -hmm. and I've built so many PowerPoints I never imagined I would be building. Um, but there's a gift that comes in each of those performances. And as, you know, painstaking as it is to put the PowerPoint together, line up all the information that you want to have in your presentation, when you get to that presentation piece, and you're in the pocket of it. I always learn something new. So it's never about me sending the information out and it's only being delivered one way. Somehow, information comes back that expands the information that I've had into a new light, add a protocol piece to it, insight, or even a, just a comment from someone, and it's completely transformed. And I know in the performance world, we get that too from the applause of the audience. We get it from comments people make. 
and then we get it from right within the, the music as you can feel the excitement that comes up. And if you've played the tune before, but all of a sudden, like you were talking about, you add those extra little decorative pieces to it. Those decorative pieces, you know where they fall really well to excite the audience and how you can flip them around depending on where the, the audience kind of is. And it's that nuance. And I'm just thinking about that from a perspective of someone who has a fear of doing a presentation or being able to tell people something. One, if they tell people something, they might be transforming the other person just with an idea, a comment, just even a thank you can, can transform. But then that second piece is where, where does it take you? And by taking that one step forward to do something different, all of a sudden now you have a different idea and the other person may have a different idea. Or in the case of how you and I came together, Colin, we've, we've been manifesting all kinds of ideas because one person said, I think the two of you should meet. They have some things that, that are in so common, true. right? Um, and I just look at that and I think, wow, all that can happen because somebody decides they're going to share their talent. Music, dance, presentation. Yeah. And the collaborative nature of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you never know who you're going to inspire or who's going to inspire you. And, um, you know, if one person gets up on the dance floor to start, if one couple gets up, if there's a, if there's a smile for, from two people in the audience at a conference, um, sometimes people will tell stories and it's this idea about, you know, the stories for the moment or the just something slightly different or hearing a, a tune in a different way or doing you know doing a step step dance in a slightly different way the idea about when you're doing the choreography there was something new that people had could add to their portfolio that they could that choose from for 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 the next dance mm -hmm. for the next uh, mm -hmm. event. Um, one of my favorite stories from step dance, um, when we came to Cape Breton for the first time to visit, we, we were living out in the West um, in Canada. And um, one of the amazing step dancers in the hall um, allowed us to have a visit to the farm, pulled pulled doors out from the barn, put them down on the ground, had his steel-toed boots on, and he step-danced on top of this door in the middle of the yard. And I was like, you know, I come from, wow. I come from a dance studio with a wooden floor, with bars, mirrors. <laughs> I'm in the middle of a farm, and he's, he's dancing with steel-toed boots on this door, and he has the most intricate footwork. But what used to happen in the hall before everybody had phones and could videotape was you would watch a step dancer do their solo and they would have their signature steps. And so you would kind of try to pick up what kind of step were they doing? And then you'd go home and then you would spend practicing all week long playing with that step, but you would do something to it that would tweak it, that would make it your step. And you would be really good at it by the next week because you would have walked yourself through it so many times, the right ways, the wrong ways, the way you liked it. Um, and, and then the next dance, you'd get up and you would have done what would they would now term your step. And they would, they'd call it Elaine's step or they would call it the beaten step and it would get a nickname. And then that's how the steps continued to evolve, which is really interesting. But what fascinated me with this particular piece was here he is in his steel-toed boots. He would come home from the dance. He'd go into the barn so he didn't wake anybody up. And he would dance out in the barn until the sun came up. And then he'd go to bed after he'd milked the cows. And I just think, wow, you know, if we all took the time to find that passion within 
the step, the performance, the presentation where, where we found the nugget and then we could respond from the nugget. It, it's just fascinating. Absolutely. And the passion, the flow from that, that, that that's really incredible. That's a really incredible story mm -hmm. about the gentleman on, on the farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he just, you know, like the inspiration from that, that that's the inspiration from the music, from the people around him, from the occasion, from the event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if that's for house concerts or house parties are like in Cape Breton, I think there's going to be a heck of a lot more people coming this year. Especially <laughs> after COVID. You know, and, and not people only being able to travel again or you know the conferences on the island as well I, mm -hmm. gosh yeah. that 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 speaks volumes yeah yeah <laughs> um there was a couple of things that we we um kind of threw back and forth about getting back to that that heart of the performance and i wanted to bring up two spots um from a performance perspective, I had I had um, I had one time I had three soloists. They were back to back, so I'm, I'm at a dance competition, and I have to put the music on for them. They go out, do their solo, come back. I put the next person on, but the first one went out, came off crying. So now I'm trying to console this poor child, and, and they're like, I think around nine years old. And then the second soloist had to go out. So I had to say, I'm, I'm really sorry, sweetheart. You know, just hold on a minute. And I put the music on for the next person to go out. Who came off crying? Didn't make it through the performance. Now I have two sobbing little ones. And I have a third one that has to go out. So I send that third one out and the same thing. It was the most bizarre event because that hardly ever happened. You might have somebody who would come off. They hadn't finished their solo correctly. And that happens. But I had three of them. And I looked at it and I went, OK, so what happened here? The nerves were so high backstage that it reverberated through the, through the dancers. And so we had this <laughs> domino effect. So we went mm -hmm. back to the studio. And I, I wanted to tell this story because just so people can understand the impact of these simple tools um, that we've been sharing, is we went back to the studio and discovered there were components to their performance that made them uncomfortable. And so when they got up to that part in their performance and, and the stakes were high, the, the emotions were so high at the competition, that was enough for them to completely lose memory and then fall out of their performance. So we ended up um, doing a little balance for each of them. And I call it a balance, which is really we're using some of those different energy techniques to just bring balance and flow back to the performance. And so we did, I can perform anytime, anywhere, in any situation. And we set the parameters up of that. And then what we did is we ran the routine facing different directions. Because we discovered for one of the performers in the studio rehearsing, she always faced west. When she got on the stage at the competition, the front of the stage faced north. Some people are memorizing their routines by how they're oriented in space, not by this is the front. I can do this as the front, but, I'm, but not everybody can do that. And so when we did that balance, we, we then had her perform in each direction, and she had to perform it so there was no errors. She did. We had banana energetically able to remove that barrier so that no matter what direction she was going to face, even if it was the corner, she was going to be okay. And I just thought I would bring that up because sometimes people don't realize what's going to be a trigger for them. I had another a dancer, we were trying to figure out what bothers people on a stage. One dancer was walking up the stairs to get onto the stage. And in many of the performance halls, you have to go up a set of stairs to get to the stage. So if every time you go to do a performance, you walk up those stairs and that knocks you out of your comfort zone, 
that's a problem because you're not going to enjoy doing uh, presentations or performance. And someone else was the lights that shine not at you that come from the back of the hall, but the ones that were right over top that came straight down. There was something that was a barrier that way. And so once we got rid of those little details, their performances became quite clean and they loved what they were doing. But can you imagine for that poor person walking up the stairs that never managed to fix that? They might actually stop performing. They might actually stop speaking. And they don't know why. They just, that's the reaction that's going to be. It's uncomfortable and that's the end. Um, but we were really able to make those shifts. I, I think that that's really, that, that's, that would have been life-changing for them, you know, to have, uh, and because there's enjoyment there, that means that, that might be carried on in life. You know, that doorway mm -hmm. remains open, that gate mm -hmm. remains open. And when I th sometimes I think about musicians wanting to sit perhaps on the left-hand side of the accordionist or, you know, sit in a certain way or at an, a certain angle t to the audience. S some bands like to sort of be in a, I think the ECO Australian Chamber Orchestra, they're sort of in a semicircle w when, when they're playing. Some other places might be, you know, just like row, um, several rows together, people playing. But um, it's yes, I, I think I think that that's those are certainly factors to be considered. And so, what you're helping to do is put people at ease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Find the problem, mm -hmm. how, how small it might be, and then create the space for everybody to find that heart-centered performance where they don't have to worry about the reaction. And that reaction, of course, is an unfounded reaction, right? It's, it's something that's come along and developed a lovely pattern for us, but doesn't need to be there. And it definitely um, can be easily taken away. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that you're on the case. <laughs> I, I really am. And there, I know. I know there are certainly other people I know who are glad of that as well. <laughs> so why don't we take our two talents and bring them together? And I know mm -hmm. we did this in season two by walking through the chakras and playing music for each of the chakras to be able to bring them into balance. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'd like to do this time, though, is uh, we'll put this package together. It's going to be attached to this part of the podcast, but then we'll be able to put it as its own. So if it is supportive to people that they could use it again in another way, then we hope that we can share it out. Does that sound? Absolutely. Okay? Ab absolutely. Because, you know, the, these tools are timeless. You can use them any part of the day or night, any part of the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they'll still be relevant in five, 10, 15, 20 years time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's huge. That's like the, the, the music or the, the conferences, you know, it's still gonna be around for a long time. Yeah. And that's the, you know, um, and you'll use it one way, but the next time you go to use it, going to use it a different way, which is also really interesting. Um, and what you use it for one time, you won't need to do that because you'll have resolved that. You probably even will have forgotten about it, even being a challenge. And the next time you come to the tools, you'll be using them for something else. And that means you're taking layers off. And layers are fantastic because that's getting again to that, that heart-centered performance. Um, especially if you have several layers that kind of have been stacking on top of each other. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's like the layers of an onion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we just set up, we did a card at the beginning with an affirmation, and that was a way for us to be able to help people to be balanced. 
as they were coming through listening to the podcast. And we uh, solidified that with our cups of tea. So now let's us walk through some of the examples I talked about of what I could put into a package. And then um, uh, if I introduce the idea, and then if you want to bring your music in, we'll bring a synergy to those uh, each of those components. That sound okay? okay? Uh, that sounds more than okay. Let, let's see what we can create. Okay. Um, so for those listening to the podcast, you're not going to be able to see what I'm doing, which is not going to be very much, but I'll try to describe each piece and then I'm going to just have Colin play and I'm going to actually be doing the activity. I don't want to say anything because I want you to just kind of be, you know, lost in it. But if it's of value, I'll chip in with a, a word or two if it's required. Okay, let's, let's start. So we need a goal. What is it you want to be different? What is it you would like to have more of? And it can be as simple as I easily and joyfully enjoy performing in front of people, or I, um, I let go of holding too tight to the information and I allow it to just be sent out to the people. That could be an, another option because sometimes we, we hold so tight to what we want to say that we can't say it very well. <laughs> okay, so as you're thinking about your goal, you've got a piece of paper. You're going to try to write it down. You're going to close your eyes. You're just going to envision it. And Colin is going to play some music to help you just bring that vision into focus. <laughs>
Wow. I was thinking about um, anybody putting the, their goal together. You walked them through the difficult parts of the goal and then you brought them into this beautiful synergy at the end. It was a balance all in itself. <laughs> it was just, oh, beautiful. Yes, um, the, the keys there, yes. Um, I think that the keys there were sort of, it's almost like going into an area where we might only go a couple of times a year or maybe even less than that. It might even be with a performance or talking about a subject. Um, Putting putting new ideas forward about something that you're passionate about, for example, mm -hmm. or maybe playing a tune in a different way, and the first or learning a new skill, you know, sometimes with goals we want to learn a new skill or augment skills that we already have, so it sort of appears difficult first, and the idea about you know where where I was going first was it's it's possible uh, it might take a while before it becomes easier and then as as it becomes easier it's sort of like the sun rising mm -hmm. just you know or seeing the beauty of a landscape coming alive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. awesome awesome okay so um, so we have hydration next. So being able to sip some water, make sure it's gone into the system and you can rub between the hyoid, the hyoid bone, <laughs> that'd be in your throat. We don't want that. Xiphoid process. That's what I wanted to say, which is at the bottom of the ribs. So where the, the ribs come together in the center of uh, the chest, you're going to rub um, not there, but go from there down towards the belly button, halfway between the belly button and that xiphoid process. So we're going to, between those two points, we're going to go right into the center and just give a rub. And it'll be a firm rub, which could have a little bit, feel like somebody's poking you with a pencil. If that's the case, you can just back up a little bit on the pressure and um, just hold the space even if you need to. It's a great way to rehydrate the whole system. And if you... Uh, tend to not drink enough water, then you may notice this uh, over time, it's going to actually start to um, lessen that you can feel that tension in there. Okay, so you're going to sip on your water, uh, swish it around in your mouth, then swallow, and then rub in the point, and we'll see what Colin's going to put to music for us. Awesome. It starts out, um, I'm, I'm kind of with the music, but by the time you've finished, I'm like in the music. <laughs> can feel the difference. Yeah. Okay, so if we go to the next part, which is either the hand rub or the foot rub. And for those people that are on the podcast listening, I'm going to describe it. And 
You can do the one component, the very first one, and it's effective. But it's even more powerful if you make sure you do the full package. And for anybody who needs to look up how to do this, on my YouTube channel, on um, at Michelle Greenwell, um, if you go into the Dance Integration playlist, it's the very first one, and it's called the Bioenergetic uh, Dance Warm-Up. You're just looking for the foot rub part. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on the hand. So if you just want to make a fist just to see what your hand feels like before we start, that'll give you an um, idea when we finish, okay? And what we're going to do is rub between the bones on the top of the hand with firm pressure. Then we're going to rub on the side of the hand with firm pressure. Then we're just going to shake up the bones a little bit, put some space in between. And then we're gonna go like this little piggy, we're gonna go down each digit circling it. So we're opening the joint up and we're also putting a little pressure on the end of each finger. We're gonna hug all over the hand. And the part at the end that's really important is we're gonna put our fingers into the middle and we're gonna pull them apart. So if I put my fingers into the center of my hand, I'm going to take my fingers towards my knuckles and my thumb is actually going to work up towards my wrist. And what that means is I'm giving a message to the muscle that says it's turning on, and it actually puts strength in. And you can do it across the fingers, and you can do it into the palm of the hand. So I may have to interrupt the music a little bit on this one, Colin, just to describe it, because I know for people it would be hard to, to get all those pieces. Um, you can do the same on the foot, and if the foot I would actually stand on one foot afterwards and see what it feels like for all the joints to connect before I did the other side. So just so you could feel the difference between the two feet. But for our intention purposes here, um, I'm just going to take each hand and I'm going to uh, walk us through. And you know what the hands felt like before we started. And then we'll see what they feel like when we're finished. All right. So rubbing between the hands are both. Side of the knuckle. Taking up the hand.
Transfer it to your feet. <laughs> oh, it was fun. It was fun. Oh my gosh. Okay, so when you take your hands, put them on your knees and transfer it down to your feet. Whatever we did on the hands immediately is picked up by the feet. So you might feel them go light um, and just have an ease about them. And I'm hoping that you're noticing your hands when you um, make the fist, you don't notice the same amount of tension or stiffness. It actually, um, uh, stronger grip that happens with that. So from a Fiddler's perspective or a pianist, um, that articulation then that can come through the joints of the fingers and hand is incredibly different. Thank you, Colin. You're welcome. And I think there's vers there's even more versatility in the fingers for the musicians there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the possibilities of what they might be playing for the audience as well. Mm -hmm, mm hmm exactly. Okay, so if we go to the ear rub, this was the one that I talked about um, putting you on the beat of the music, uh, which is great for dancers and musicians. Um, also for delivery to make sure that you have the speed of your presentation, because when you're nervous, you'll talk really fast. <laughs> you'll even try not to talk fast, but you still will. This is a way actually that calms you down and allows you to, to be back present in a more of a flow. All right, so um, for those people that are on a podcast listening in, I'm going to take my fingers and squeeze to the top of the earlobe where I can just kind of unroll the outer edges of my ear. I'm going to go down to the bottom of my ear. I'm going to go back in, and I'm going to go a little bit deeper and just kind of pull this time to the bottom of the ear. And then I'm going to go a little bit deeper again, almost to the center of the ear, and I'm going to pull. So I'll do three times on one ear, and then I'm going to do three times on the other ear. And if you want to check in with your tension in your neck to see what the flow is like before we start, you can check again at the end to see how it's changed. All right. Thanks, Colin. I feel that actually in my back, which is really interesting. Right around kidneys, uh, center of the lower part of the back, I can just feel it's come alive, which is interesting. I never felt that before doing the ear rub. So that was, that's really cool. Thank you for that. Um, and if just for the audience, if you just want to turn your head and see if your range of motion has changed on the neck, and you may notice that you have more 
of the tissue through the back wanting to rotate than just the neck isolation. And that means we have whole body integration happening. Okay. It's very interesting. <laughs> and you can do this at home. You can do this in preparation. Mm -hmm. You could do this in... Um, you could even do this on stage while you're warming up or while you're setting up, whether mm -hmm. you're do, doing before doing public speaking or doing a performance or waiting in the wings, so to mm -hmm. speak. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it isn't, nobody really questions when you just rub your ear for a second. Um, and if, if you happen to be in a room where you have trouble with uh, lots of noise in the background, that'll actually bring clarity. So you can focus on the person talking right in front of you and not have that background buzz bothering you. That can be helpful for that too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to a spine rotation. And I introduced this because uh, I talked about that belt channel in getting the whole body to talk and be open. So for those people who are listening to the podcast, what I'm going to do with my hands is I'm just going to take my hands out in front like I'm holding a, um, a balloon out in front of me or a ball. I'm just going to move my chair back. And then um, that I'm going to pull the balloon far enough forward that I can feel my shoulder blades open. And then I'm just going to move myself over top of one knee. So the balloon would be over that knee. And then I would move myself over so it's over top of the other knee. So you don't even have to turn very far. We're just going to go back and forth. And because Colin's going to be playing the music, this is going to be lovely. We've got the frequency that's coming up the spine. So we have each vertebra has a different tone it likes to vibrate at. And as you start to put space in there, you may notice different sensations coming through the spine. Or as I was saying, my, my kidneys and my lower back, I was really starting to feel uh, the bubbly lightness. Um, you may feel something like that as well. All right. You want to give your balloon a color, you can do that too. Color's always good. Bring it to the left. And then I'm coming back to the right. Over to the left. just feel that go straight up. I'm hoping everybody's sitting taller because I know I am. <laughs> and the last one is emotional stress release points. These are points that hap are on the uh, forehead. And if you take your fingertips of both hands and just put them lightly across the forehead. So my pinky fingers are somewhere in the center of my forehead to over top of my the, um, just above my center of the eyebrows. And then it goes out so the fingertips kind of go across the whole forehead. And this you hold really, really light because you're going for the electrical charge in your fingertips, not pressure on it. And it's that connection of the electricity that pulls it from the back brain, which is your survival uh, fight or flight tightness. And it brings it to the front where you can actually solve problems. So. 
I don't know what you're going to play with this one, Colin, but as you're thinking about your goal, everyone, thinking about some of the barriers or some of the ways you'd like to let go of things, just holding the fingertips, you're going to solve problems while you're, while you're holding. Here we go. hoping people noticed a great big sigh somewhere in there with the, the breath either went deeper or you just let go. <laughs> oh, Colin, thank you so much for bringing the music into those exercises. I've never actually been able to add music to it. So um, what you do with frequency really transforms those exercises in a, a really profound way. So thank you. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome, Michelle. And thank you for bringing this to our attention because I really think it's going to be, these are really, really useful tools for people to have. So thank, thank you for bringing this to our attention, being musicians and um, the idea about people using this for speaking, you know, at conferences as well. Just, and your dancers as well. They're, it's this communication with the audience from a performer's perspective or a, pers or a speaker's perspective, there is a possibility that the audience will now take more away or the dancers will, instead of maybe concerts finishing at 11.30 p.m., it'll now be 3.30 a.m. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the dancers will still be light of early morning. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There is the, those possibilities are real, and you know uh, it would be great to see this, maybe in the kitchen fest or the colours. Just you know, just people sampling this. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm and any speakers out there, you know, would love to have your feedback. Yes. Yeah. Musicians as well, actually, dancers as well. <laughs> Uh, and I think it's, you know, to be able to take it past that place of where all of us are just told it'll go away or the butterflies are there, it's part of performance. They might be, but they don't have to be debilitating. They don't have to place you in a position where you're really uncomfortable doing what you're doing. And, oh my gosh, when you can get past all of those ideas, frustrations, fear, whatever it happens to be that holds you back from being your very best at sharing with other people, what opens up and is possible just because you took a few minutes to make sure that it was going to be open and flowing for yourself. You know, you, you transform a room. And I think everybody deserves that. Uh, as the presenter, you deserve that. And as the audience member, you deserve that. And so um, thinking differently and uh, taking advantage of the fact that it can be different. I hope people will dive into that idea. And be open to the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And be open to those possibilities. 
Because mm-hmm. I'm sure the audience, there was more enjoyment. There's a higher level of enjoyment there. Mm-hmm. And I have a, a, a quote that I wanted to bring up that I've always kind of, I put it up on kind of on my um, shelf in the office, but I always kept it in the back of my mind. And somebody had once said to me that it was very selfish to hold the audience hostage with your insecurities to perform. And so if you could let the audience be your focus, that they they came for an experience, they came for a joyful opportunity, and it's your job to deliver that. And so instead of thinking from how you feel about your performance or perspective, but to look at what the perspective of the audience is, by adding these tools in, you guarantee that the presentation you're going to give is one that the audience is going to receive in a completely different way, but their joy and excitement about what you have to offer is going to be magnified because you took the time to be different with it. And you took the time to be you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, Colin, you and I, oh my gosh, always, always a delight. And, uh, I look forward, I know this is a a longer podcast, um, but I hope for those people that got to the end and stayed to to be able to experience all of this, that they really felt like they got something of value that they're going to be able to take forward with them and uh, to think differently about. Anything you'd like to provide for the end? Um, Well, thank thank you for inviting me on to this podcast, Michelle, and... um, from a musician's point of view, from a performer's point of view, from a speaker's point of view, these tools are really invaluable. And I'll, I'm, I will be using them. Previously, I've been using F- EFT as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and but I'm definitely bringing these into the, the toolbox now. So thank you. And um, where can people find out more? Yeah. So dancedebut.com is where they can find my resources. Um, And one of the books that I would recommend that you can find in the shop is Bioenergetic Essentials. And so these tools are actually in the book and you can just follow along uh, with the descriptions that are there and you'll find some other ones in there too that can be very helpful and they can actually advance some of the things we did today. But I would like to comment about the fact that if they come back to this recording, they have you playing. So you actually magnify these exercises in a really profound way. How can they find you, Colin? Go to CelticFiddleGuru.com or you can email support at CelticFiddleGuru.com and you'll find out more about what I do or if you can see that, that's a sample. If we can see that, those on the podcast can't see it, but... uh, Behind Colin, he's got a banner of his Celtic fiddle classes that are online, group coaching and one-on-one coaching. Thank you very much, Michelle. You are welcome. Season three, we are devoting to the transformational process that happens when people reach into their authentic selves and create magic. Our session has several publications this year, sorry, our season. (laughs) This session had several pieces our, session, um, our season has several publications this year, and we hope they inspire and empower you to consider living your true heart's desire with the love and compassion for others at the forefront. Thank you for joining us. This is Be Well with Michelle Greenwell, wishing you well-being. Take care.